times uh, during covid when we're all sitting at home it's it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together it certainly brightens up my evenings aaj pandemic mein hum digitally the literature festival kar rahe hain aur mujhe lagta hai कि हमारे सामने श्रोता नहीं है हम आपस में बात कर रहे हैं लेकिन उस फील को उस उमंग को महसूस कर सकते हैं कि हजारों लाखों लोग हमसे जुड़े हुए हैं हमको सुन रहे हैं और कहीं ना कहीं कोई सार्थक हस्तक्षेप हो रहा है पीपल हु केम ऑनलाइन टू व्यू एंड लिसन टू आर इनक्रेडिबल स्पीकर्स फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द वर्ल्ड वी वर एबल टू कंटिन्यू इन आवर ट्रेडिशन ऑफ इंश्योरिंग द फ्री फ्लो ऑफ नॉलेज एंड इंफॉर्मेशन On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sanjoy Roy, and all of us at Teamwork Arts, I welcome you to the session of the Jaipur Literature Festival online series 2021. Our session today is China Room, Sanjeev Sahota in conversation with Georgina Godwin. British novelist Sanjeev Sahota's recent novel China Room follows the intertwined stories of the brides of three brothers in Punjab in 1929 and a young man from England. who travels to the now deserted farmland in 19- 1999 traversing through the fabric of time segregation and empire the tale explores a family's trauma and one man's attempts at breaking free from addiction and racism and his consequent search for home in conversation with journalist and broadcaster georgina godwin sanjeev explores the lives of these prisoners of circumstance and the pursuit of freedom Sanjeev Sahota is the author of Ours Are the Streets and the Year of the Runaways which was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and the Dylan Thomas Prize and was awarded the 2017 European Union Prize for Literature. In 2013 he was named one of Granta's 20 best of young British novelists of the decade. Georgina Godwin is books editor for Monocle 24 and the host of Meet the Writers Monocle Reads and the globalist she chairs literary events worldwide and hosts a number of commercial podcasts she's on the boards of the charities english pen and developing artists do follow our handles on facebook twitter and instagram to get notified on our upcoming sessions all our sessions that have been broadcast in now have been archived and are available on this website in the mobile tent venue and also on our facebook and youtube channel Ladies and gentlemen we now present China Room Sanjeev Sahota in conversation with Georgina Godwin over to you Georgina Very many thanks to you Kritika and Sanjeev what an absolute delight to talk to you I've been a fan of your work for many years and China Room I found just profoundly moving as Kritika says it interweaves the stories of a, a child bride living in a village in 1920s punjab uh, and her british born and raised great grandson he returns to the village in 1999 and um, i thought that perhaps we should start by a reading really from the very very beginning of the book just to, to root our audience uh, into exactly what it is that we're talking about here yeah i'm very happy to do that thanks georgina i'm really pleased to be here with you and um thanks to the festival as well for inviting me um so yeah i'll just read straight from the um beginning so no real context is is required mehar is not so obedient to 15 year old that she won't try to uncover which of the three brothers is her husband already the morning after the wedding and despite nervous trembling hands She combines varying amounts of lemon, garlic and spice in their side plates of sliced onions and then attempts to to detect the particular odor on the man who visits later that same night invisible to her in the dark. It proves inconclusive, the strongest smell by far her fear. So she tries again after overhearing one of the trio complaining about the calluses on his hands. Her concentration is fierce when her husband's palm next strokes her naked arm. but then too she isn't certain maybe all male hands feel so rough so clumsily eager and dry it is 1929 summer is erupting and the brothers do not address her in one another's presence indeed they barely speak to her at all and she it goes without saying is expected to remain dutiful veiled and silent like the other new brides 
Spying from her window, she sees only her brother's likeness, the brother's likeness. Close in age, they share the same narrow build, with unconvincing shoulders and grave eyes. Serious faces that carry no slack, features that follow the same rules. The three are evenly bearded, the hair trimmed short and tight, and all day they wear loose turbans cut from the same saffron wrap. Most hours the brothers will be out working the fields, playing, drinking, while she weaves and cooks and shovels and milks, until those evenings when Mai, their mother, says to her, raising a tea glass to grim lips, not the China room tonight. I'll leave it there. It's so beautifully written. It's, it's a really an amazing book. And I understand that it was influenced by, by your own family experience. Uh, how so? Yeah, the, um, I suppose the original seed of the book um, grew from a bit of family law that's been um, kind of ricocheting, ricocheting around my family for as long as I can remember. And that's that um, one of my great grandmothers was one of four brides married in a single ceremony to um, four brothers and that none of them knew which brother it was they were married to because they um, because they were sequestered in in a room um, called the women's room um, for the entire for the early part of their marriage because they lived on a rural homestead out in the middle of um, Punjab where there was you know there was obviously no electricity it was just complete darkness and they only really encountered their husbands um, or had need to encounter their husbands um, at night um, and the story goes and how much of this has been embellished over the years you know lord knows that they didn't work they didn't know who was their husband until they saw a year later who was holding which baby and that was the first instance that they that things kind of clicked for them but it was interesting that it was always a story spoken of in my family at least at least with a, a deal of humor with a degree of like levity as if say these unquestioning ancestors from way back when you know who kind of accepted these things without um kind of um railing against them or had no choice but to kind of accept them but it always just seemed like quite a dark and painful um story to me and that that room that so-called women's room is still there on the farm that belongs to my family in India that is now used as a grain store, but the, the barred windows, the window there is, is barred. Um, and there was also this, I suppose, so there were two things. There was that story of my my great grandmother or that, that legend, I suppose I should call it. And um, secondly, there was the existence of, of a room, which was was known to be used, used to be the women's room. Um, and thirdly, there was also this kind of like, this quite a sketchy story of, um, another ancestor, male ancestor from around that same time who was had some sort of scandal with the Indian independence movement, which was burgeoning at the same time. So I guess those three things um, were kind of the posts around which I weaved that part of um, the, the story and, and the novel, though it took a lot of, I left it, I abandoned it, I came back to it. And it was, it was, it was a long time before the whole thing kind of came together as, as a complete whole. Uh, and how close to you personally is the modern day protagonist, the, the boy who, who turns up at his uncle's place in 1999? I mean, you, for instance, grew up in the, in the north of England, exactly the same as this boy. There, there are many, many parallels. Yeah, I'd say it's, um, there are, you know, correspondences between my life and that of the um, unnamed narrator he's i think he's given the initial s and i think that's about um that's about it so i was you know brought up in north of england i um you know without wishing to itemize which of the things that he experienced are drawn on um my life or not there are um certainly connections so i'd say that section of the novel is it's kind of an, an auto-fictional kind of Strand. So that to that it starts off in 2019 with the with the 40 year old narrator, or he's probably a bit younger than that, going to look after his um, parents following his father's knee surgery, and that's all true. That happened in May 2019, or in when my father had knee surgery. And I went back to kind of um, take care of things, 
Um, and from that point, the story kind of refracts backwards in time, um, through, through time and through memory and through language into these other into these others kind of pasts and these other selves. And that's interesting to me. That's what auto fiction does. It takes things from a point of factual truth and biographical truth into kind of another kind of truth, dramatic truth and fictional truth. And I think that's what I like that strand to do without wishing to deny that there is an auto-fictional element there. It's also important for me that um, I, I do lay claim to the fact that this is also a work of art and takes use of all the adventures of the, of the artistic form as well. Mm. I mean, there is there is one definite uh, uh, truth that, that both characters, the real one and, and the fictional one, share, which is that neither, neither you nor S in the book had read a book until they were 18. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's true. I somehow seem to have bypassed the novel all through my kind of educational uh, or compulsory education. So yeah, I got to 18 and though, you know, at school I'd read poetry and like and excerpts in anthologies, the novel somehow, I think we were one particular year where the, the, our English teacher decided we weren't going to do an actual full novel. So yeah, I was 18 and um, it was a summer before university on my way to India and I picked up, I picked up a novel then and it kind of, it was a little like, um, I mean, no, no, turning points only ever, only ever become evident as turning points after the fact when you're looking back on yourself and, and you start noticing what were the key things that kind of got me to this point. But looking back, it does feel like experiencing the novel at that point, um, it kind of, it was the first time I think I encountered, I recognised that meaning, because I think I was, in my adolescence, I was always looking for meaning, like what, what, you know, where, where, where am I, who am I, what's my, what am I doing? And reading novels really showed me that meaning is something that can be produced in between the reader and the writer. And actually, and slowly over time, as I read more and more novels, it just became evident, evident to me that, um, reading novels is a perfectly valid way of spending a life, really, yeah. Uh, that particular novel was Salman Rushdie's Midnight Children. And I wonder what you what you went on to read. I mean, what, who or who has had the biggest influence on your work? Um, well, I went, I, immediately, I can, quite unusually probably, I can remember the first four novels I read really, really clearly. Um, it was Midnight Children, followed by um, The God of Small Things, then A Fine Balance, and then The Remains of the Day. And after that, it's, I can't remember, it's, it's, it's all just a blur. I think I was just reading one after another, three or four novels a week, just very quickly, because I just couldn't really, as if I just needed to, um, I just, well, I suppose I just couldn't get enough of it. Um, influences are, are tricky. I don't think any of those novels particularly I suppose The Fine Balance was the first novel that completely sort of, uh, I was 19 and just kind of devastated me. I couldn't really, it was the first time I'd been made to feel like that about a bunch of made up people. I made to feel like in that way. Um, and so access or trying to give the reader access to strong emotion has always, perhaps that's why it has always been quite important to me. Um, mm. In terms of style, um, I, you know, I, th I'm, I think I recognise that my style is quite spare. It's quite um, um, economical. I don't, I do, I don't like to spill a drop, really. I don't like any kind, I like things to be as terse and as hard one and as clear as I can get. I approach the page with a great deal of um, caution, really. You know, I think, you know, the first line of my very first novel, is on our on our street says at last the page is stained and I do see when I'm writing that I am you now I'm staining the page with my words and if I must stain it I have to approach it so so deliberately and um, and carefully um, I'm always think I want my novels to be as as tight and as short as I can um, get them I really value that kind of this kind of strained terseness which I suppose writes like Joan Didion um, curtsy. Um, um, Helen Garner, the Australian writer, um, the poet Les Murray, another Australian. Um, uh, I was going to say Tim Winton. Lots of Australians seem to write in this way that I like. Um, but yeah, I suppose that kind of um, 
really that, that kind of clarity of gaze and that strength of that kind of power in that strong gaze that doesn't stop looking. That's what I really value on the page. And that's what I really want to get my writing to be. In the book, you reference Henry James, a uh, portrait of a lady. Uh, yes. And you mull on Isabel Archer and the differences between the old world and the new that, that she was straddling. And of course, 1920s India was on just such a cusp. And I wondered if you could give us the political background then, because it's very relevant to the story. As you say, that is the third strand. Yeah, so in 1920s, the Free India movement, and sometimes called the Quit India movement, was kind of really gathering some some speed, you know, to, to kind of get the British um, out of India. And particularly in, there was lots of local uprising, particularly around Lahore, Amritsar, Jalandhar, Jalandhar's kind of near where the novel is set. And alongside this, um, and there was also, and also what had happened with the Great Indian, what's called the Great, the, uh, kind of the Indian Depression, an economic depression was happening because the English mills had stopped accepting grain from England, where, where at the same time, the, the Brits had also raised the land, the rents on, on Indian land. So, so the Indian farmers had no way of paying for it without um, pawning their gold very cheaply again to the British. And that caused kind of mass uprisings and mass protests. So it was a really combustible, combustible time. And what was yeah. it, though I didn't want to write very directly about um, that movement and have characters who are really, you know, have, um, cannot go inside that movement. It's really, um, it was really important to me that what was going on in the house on that farm reflected was kind of a microcosm of what was going on outside. So the secrets, the lies, the, the subterfuge, not knowing who to trust, the constantly looking behind your back. That's very much of a piece with what's going on outside of that farm in the wider society. And it's just, it's because, you know, what's happening out in the world does impinge on, you know, politics will make its way into your house, into your bedroom. So it was very important for me to make sure that was, that was in there. And I'm really glad you mentioned Henry James because I mean, the portrait of a lady is a bit of a, kind of a lodestar um, for me. And I see, I think, you know, and there are connections between Isabel Archer and with not just Meher, but with Radhika as well in the story, you know, two women, two restive, clever, confident women, kind of at odds with um, a brutal patriarchal society that's, that's around them. And also, I think just um, another reason why I wanted that nod to Henry um, Henry James and Isabel Archer in there is because he, like another writer like um, Edith Wharton, who's often compared with Henry James, there's lots of triangles in their books, triangulated dynamics, triangulated relationships. And one of the way China Rooms works is through this idea of triangles and threes. So there's the three sisters, the three brothers, there's Suraj, Meher and um, um, Jeet, and there's also Radhika Tanvir and the narrator, it sort of takes across three summers. So this idea of triangles and threes was another way in which, and how those triangles touch across time, how the corner of one triangle, say Meher touches with, say, a, a character like Cuckoo in, a, in, in another time, in another space, and in, another, in her own little triangle. So triangles are ones within which I grounded um, the novel in terms of its, its kind of its formal architecture as well. Um, but yeah. So interesting the way that, that you flip between 1999 and, and, and 1929 um, and, and just just talking about those triangles. I wonder how you talked at the beginning about coming back to the book and abandoning it and going backwards and forwards. And so I wonder if you could just talk a, a little bit more about that form and the structure and the process of it and whether in fact it turned out being the book that you wanted to write. Yeah, it's... Um... No, great question. I think that's the book kind of taught me how to write it. it was, so I started off, as I said, with with this seed of an idea about this this story of this great grandmother. And I wrote about and this would have been back in twenty sixteen. I wrote about ten thousand words and abandoned it. I didn't see, and that was the only strand I was working on because um, I didn't see why it had to be written. I didn't see why I had to write this story about this time drawing the burgeoning in the Indian independence movement. And I imagine it was going to be some long novel coming up to the present day. And I just, 
lost um, hope in it. And also, like I said, I just didn't see why. I, I couldn't see the urgency for that kind of story. Um, so I set it aside thinking I'm done with that. I'm never going to touch that again. And I started, and I was suddenly became quite intrigued by the idea of the doppelganger. So a doppelganger, someone, you know, your double and what that might mean. It's quite a potent image in Indian folklore as well as in, in other um, mythologies as well. And I started writing um, a novel with a kind of a doppelganger motif running through it. And it was kind of set somewhere in the future. And weirdly, there was a kind of a contagion happening at that time. This would have been in 2018 or so in the novel. Um, but well, then slowly that novel wasn't quite working with that doppelganger motif and I slowly I put myself into that novel, myself as a, as a, as a character in the novel, but as an older version of me in the future. So slowly over time that doppelganger motif became actually, I became the doppelganger, almost it came, the doppelganger became a version of me in this other book I was writing and this version of me slowly became this older version of me, so it became younger and younger and younger until it almost was a version of me at the present time. And then it kind of became a version of me in, in the past. And then I started to see hang connections between this version of me, this unnamed narrator and this story I'd abandoned about three years previously about this young 15 year old Meher who was a great grandmother based on a great grandmother of mine, I started seeing that they actually they're both, not only are both stories connected by ideas of freedom, ideas of oppression, um, but they're also two characters seeking connection as well. So it was quite a shock to me that both these stories actually I saw would sit side by side, but actually they wouldn't just sit side by side, they actually they entwine around each other. Um, and then I started thinking how are these stories going to sit together in the same book. I knew I didn't want them just, I know I just didn't want to have one story after another. And so in the book, they're actually, they're spiraled around each other. We start off with quite long chapters with each um, protagonist. And then slowly as the book goes on, the chapters get shorter until the stories do start entwining around each other. And then at the very end or towards the very end, there's a moment when the narrator, um, there's a sentence in the in the 1929 strand, but it could only have been written by the 1999 narrator because he uses the word me. The word me is there. And then, so at that point, both the stories kind of knot together and questions about authorship, about who is writing the story about Mare. Is it the actual unnamed narrator who's, who's writing this story? This story, which is Mare, which is so kind of so constructed. So in this 40 sections, it's very deliberately put together. And so questions about authorship and who has the right to tell the story kind of start were also were also interesting me when I started writing this novel. And I wanted to to honor that thought that actually who has the right to tell the story of a real person who did exist, or you know, who who does and who doesn't have that right. Um and then I think at the end there's that there's that photo which really just knots the whole um spiral together in, in one kind of like flare of image. Um so that's kind of how the novel came about it was it kind of it, it I kind of backed into writing this novel slowly I, I think I, was, I thought I was going to write something else as you kind of suggested but slowly it, it kind of brought me back to to this and I love the, the, the fact that that spiral is also kind of winding up the the tension for the audience mm. You feel it kind of ratcheting don't you as it gets shorter and shorter and um, China Room is a departure I think uh, from from your previous work, um, Out of the Streets and, and The Year of the Runaways. What it does have in common with both works, though, I think is, is class. And I wonder what class means to you and how it fits alongside race and racism in your experience. Yeah, you're right. Class is not often mentioned when it's when speaking about my work, but it's for me, it's it's there in as you say, as you correctly point out, it's there in all three of my, my novels. I only tend to have characters, or I only seem to be able to write about characters that are um, working class and from a very, you know, from uh, from a world or from an area where there's a need to um, kind of prove yourself, really, and then sense of ideas of self-worth and, and trying to be are really important. Um, and class has always been, I suppose, it's, it's not surprising to me that I always write about class, seeing that I do identify as a 
as someone who's from the working class, as a working class um, writer. And growing up, I grew up in you know, the north of England in a small um, former mining town, which had been you know, devastated by the deindustrialization of the north. Um, that sense of betrayal, and that sense of just a community feeling like it's been humiliated, you know, was always there and it's still there actually. Um, but it was always certainly there. It was very potent when I was growing up. And I always felt like class was going to be the thing that was going to have the biggest impact on, on my life. And I think it did actually. I think it did much more so than, than race. I think class is something, the thing that, that's so pernicious about class is that it kind of, it, it, you don't know what opportunities aren't available to you. You don't know your idea of what is a, what, what can be constituted a successful life is so partial and limited. It's so, you know, you think it's about getting, being a, in a professional job or some kind of, you know, you go to university and you get some kind of managerial profession after that or in some, or in some sort of corporate life. And that's what you think is a successful life. But no idea about the other things, the other ways and actually you can actually hold success in your hands and you can actually consider yourself to have lived a meaningful life um and i think that's what i think when you are working class you just don't have access to those kinds of experiences um i suppose it's a yeah it's that it's that kind of poverty that i think really harms um and you know the the, the experiences of race are always are, are, are different i think but for me i've always found race to be um something that actually gave me kind of like a, a, a grand experience for racism, of course. And it was, it was, and whenever you experience racism, it, it's, it's, um, it, you know, it, it gets, it gets to something quite, quite deep in you, but always, always felt like race was something that also grounded me. It's something that gave me, um, a great deal of strength as well, actually in, in my race, whereas in my, class and perhaps it's because I'm a it's probably different if you're white and working class but when you're brown and working class um, especially when um, the conversation you know the the brown and the black working class is never actually discussed and never actually seen to actually exist it felt being brown and working class just felt as if you really were on the on the bottom on the bottom rung of the ladder kind of struggling to struggling to climb up uh, and, and presumably I mean being brown and working class and a woman uh, particularly in the case of your your, your great grandmother, I, I mean, so so difficult. You you write um, well. In fact, bef before we go there, I just wanted to, to to ask one thing about something Suraj says. Uh, it, this is during the the struggle for self rule. He says he wonders if it's better to be oppressed by your own than by the British. And of course, India, as we know, has a very strong caste system. Yeah, I mean, the caste system in India is that kind of stratification of your entire um, self kind of is, um, it's not analogous, it's, 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 it's analogous to, to class, but it's so much more invidious and so much more harmful, I think. And you're right, I've always been, um, and sometimes I get a flag for this, I've always been quite critical of my, what, what gets called my community in, in the year of the runaways, the people that were, exploiting and um, really causing harm to those immigrants were often people from their own community or called from their own community, the ones who kind of um, exploited their labor or wouldn't in, or actually took steps to demean and put them down were often people that we might expect would, you know, also people who were immigrants themselves in the past and you might expect would lend a hand, but don't. And in this book, um, as well, there's a moment when you know, Suraj says that, and there's also another moment when the unnamed narrator in the 99 round, when his talks about his parents wanting to head out on their own, and they're um, laughed at by their fellow community and kind of like um, uh, not supported in that way. Um, and yeah, that, that is my that is my um, experience. Sometimes the people that you might think would most come to your aid are often the ones that well, often the ones that date and the people that you think would to the people that you'd expect to turn the other way are often the ones that are the first to kind of like um pick you up um and that's true in my 
experience. And I suppose it just goes to show you that um, people are various and people are perverse and people behave in ways that you don't expect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I found the book, I mean, profoundly moving, uh, particularly in its description of in intergenerational trauma. And I wondered if you subscribe at all to the theory of epigenetics, so the, the study of how your behaviour and your environment can cause changes that affect the way that your genes work. In other words, you or your unnamed narrator are still channeling that, that pain. Um, yeah, I believe pain lives on. I believe trauma isn't um doesn't doesn't stop at your doesn't stop at your death i think it will carry on down carry on down the line i think you you you, you see what your parents have gone through and that feeds into your sense of yourself and they in turn would have seen what their parents have got through and it's really hard to um and i do think of now with children of a children of my own it's like how does that how does that how does that lesson i mean it's inevitable that I, something some whatever trauma i carry some of that will be passed on, but the question is how to give them tools to manage it and also how to lessen the effects of that and how to lessen the, the amount of trauma that is that is um, that is passed on. But inevitably, your environment, where you know where you grew up, the people around you, um, the stories you hear growing up, what you've seen your parents go through, what you what they've seen their parents go through. My parents also, my grandparents also lived through partition and have to flee their um, literally flee for their lives leave everything behind um, on one night um, and then you know all that how can it not actually um, how can that pain not live on and as I think the unnamed narrator says towards the end of the book um, she says um, the underlying pain does not go away it can only be paid attention to and I think that's what I that's what I really think that you, you need to make space in in the dailiness of your life to kind of like to park the trauma not forget it not try to say it never happened and, and perhaps not even try to overcome it i don't think there is any kind of redemption sometimes but to actually just um, um accept it and move on keep on moving on regardless and accepting trauma doesn't mean that you that you um, judge it to be acceptable um but it does just mean that you that you accept it and, and you and you try to, um, yeah, try to carry on, carry on with that knowledge. Earlier, you you talked about meaning, uh, and I wonder if, if you found your meaning. Is that your meaning that you do need to just accept it? Was that the meaning you found from your work? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I suppose when I say when I found meaning in, in the act of reading novels and writing them as well, but much more um, when I'm reading novels, actually, it's, it's the idea of that when, when I'm watching people, um, I'm watching like, characters go through their travails in a hypothetical arena, which we call the novel, then something in those interactions, an idea of dramatic truth, which comes up. And dramatic truth, as opposed to, say, confessional truth, which you might find in something like a memoir or a non-fiction which are also valuable as well, but I've always been find myself much more drawn to this to this idea of dramatic dramatic truth. I do that meaning is produced through other people through people interacting with each other and agreeing on what the collaborative nature of meaning and truth is, which I think is what we do when we're when we're reading a novel really really closely. Um, and especially one of the meanings that comes out of this novel is this idea of um, paying attention. You know, not paying attention to your pain and also just paying attention to um, you know, the things that are important around you. I'm just slowly, increasingly coming to the real realisation that any hope for a kind of a, a content life is, is really contingent on paying attention to you know, your work, to the people you love, to your marriage, to your children. You know, that seems to me that's where, um, that's where any hope for... Um, yeah. contentment, contentment lies. Well, and just, just finally, I want to reference something that, that the, the narrator writes of seeing his the, the father character, the dad, sitting alone in his van a couple of weeks after he's had suffered a racist attack. Uh, and it, wondering if he thought, if the dad thought that your lives here in Britain as Indians uh, would 
always be seen as fundamentally illegitimate. That was such a terribly sad line. And I wondered how far that's moved on and how your own children feel. Um, yeah, thank you. That's a really, yeah, that was, um, that was such a difficult page to write. Um, I think my, I, what I, there was um, a few weeks ago, or maybe actually a couple of months ago, um, I was trying to teach my son, who's my, my middle child, um, some words of Punjabi, um, some simple words. And he was, he was like repeating after me and kind of like, as if I was giving some sort of vocab test. And he, but then slowly he said, Daddy, why do I need to learn these? He said, oh, because, you know, um, your grandparents speak Punjabi, they're from Punjab, I speak Punjabi, your mum does, it might be nice for you to actually learn some words about, you know, where your ancestors were from. And he said, yeah, that's fine, Dad, but I am, you do know that I'm English, don't you? And that just felt to me, I felt so, um, I had to look away. I felt such a beautiful pang in my heart for, for the fact that he can, he's, he's six, and the fact that he can say that and feel that. And, um, and it just made me so, so um, moved, because it's not something I ever felt comfortable saying at any point in my life. Even now, I'd, I'd, I'd hesitate before I even say that, say that um, which is one of, the, one of the ways that pain lives on and how it kind of like takes hold of you. Um, so I, I do have lots of hope that my children's relationship with England is going to be um, less painful and just more loving and caring than mine. And partly that is it like it's a class thing. We have, you know, I have, you know, moved up that class ladder for you know for good or for good or for bad. And and so they're they're not growing up in a place where, you know, they're by people whose lives have been harmed at a policy level and therefore in, in turn they are being blamed for the harm of harm of you know, the community around them they're not being scapegoated in that way um or that, that idea of um displacement where you know you, you you put your you put your your pain and your your fear and your trauma onto a, a kind of an outsider community they're not having to go through that they're, they're growing up in a place where they're where everyone is you know do, doing well and you know reasonably um, comfortable. So I think class has had a big impact, class will have and has had a big impact on how they view their relationship with with England. Um, so I'm, I am hopeful, um, yeah, that they're, they're going to do much better than I did, yeah. Manjeev, it's been an absolute delight talking to you. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I'm so happy we could leave that on a on a hopeful note because I don't want uh, our viewers to think that that this is just a tragic book. There there is so much to be had from it in in this wonderful spiral that you take us on. It's called China Room. It's published by Harvel Secker. It's out now, and it is of course written by the wonderful uh, Sanjeev Sahota. So thank you very much to you, uh, and of course to all at Jaipur Lit Fest for facilitating this. And I hand back to you, Kritika. Thank you, thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you, Georgina, for that dripping conversation. Really looking forward to reading the book. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you all for watching and being a lovely audience. On behalf of all of us, please stay safe, stay double masked, and we will see you next week on the 16th of July with the launch of My Father, The Extraordinary Life of an Ordinary Man, Arvind Panagarya, in conversation with Mala Lal on GLF First Edition at 7 p.m. IST. Hope to see you then. times uh, during COVID when we're all sitting at home, it's, it's sort of like a ray of light that we get to watch these amazing sessions when we can't all be together. It certainly brightens up my evenings. In the pandemic, we are doing digital literature festivals and I think that 
कि हमारे सामने श्रोता नहीं है हम आपस में बात कर रहे हैं लेकिन उस फील को उस उमंग को महसूस कर सकते हैं कि हजारों लाखों लोग हमसे जुड़े हुए हैं हमको सुन रहे हैं और कहीं ना कहीं कोई सार्थक हस्तक्षेप हो रहा है पीपल ऑनलाइन to view and listen to our incredible speakers from across the world we were able to continue in our tradition of ensuring the free flow of knowledge and information